Hello Penguin Arts, I'm the Baby Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Endurance Episode 50, the finale of the series. It's been a little while because I've actually been waiting for my new computer parts to arrive and I'm actually recording on this wonderful new computer now. I'll let you know some of the specs. So we've got a Ryzen 7 3800X processor, 8 cores, 16 threads, 3.9 to 4.5 gigahertz. Whoa, it's spicy. Uh, we've got 16 gigabytes of 2660 DDR4 RAM. We also have a GTX 1070, but it's a Zotac AMP Extreme edition, so it's got extra cooling and it's overclocked. Uh, I think those are all the main ones. We've also got a 970 Pro Evo SSD, which is lightning fast, which I now have all of my games installed on. The reason why it's taken a little while is because pretty much everything that could have gone wrong during that PC build did go wrong. I got a defective motherboard, even though it was brand new. Amazon said that the processor was going to arrive in a week and then it took a month and a half so yeah now that first bifrost launch you saw me launching there and of course today we are finishing our mighty bifrost beamed power array <laughs> we've got four launches going on at once here because uh we're launching seven of them this episode so uh yeah i thought i would try and condense it down a little bit now it was taking me about an hour to launch each array. And you'll notice on that first one, uh, I'd had to actually speed it up in post more than these ones. And the UI is actually a little bit larger because I now have a 1440p 27 inch screen. So a much bigger screen, which meant I could shrink the UI a bit and have a bit more of the screen dedicated to the actual beautiful vistas uh, that you're seeing on the screen now. That's not quite as clear with four of them at the same time. Now the reason I needed the new computer is because, as, as I said, it took about an hour to launch these things. Um, the game was running so slowly with Artemis and with all the load times and everything. With the new computer, it takes 10 minutes. It took 10 minutes per Bifrost array. That's building and launching into orbit. So it made this episode so much easier to make and it's going to make videos much, much faster to produce and much more enjoyable to make in future as well. I mean, Endurance has never really been a problem for me. I've always enjoyed making it, but making this Bifrost array was a bit of a slog. I mean, there are 10 of the damn things and you got to wait for Artemis to produce the right amount of uh, material kits and specialized parts and and it takes about a week or so to produce that many, um, enough to build one of these anyway. Then you've got to construct it, and then you've got to launch it up into orbit, and ah, it's a whole great big palaver. A lot of people have actually been asking me, Beardy, why don't you launch these things all the way like down close to Archangel? That's mainly because these things are limited in how much power they can produce. Uh, I think the limit is about 300 megawatts of thermal power, and they're already maxed out at this distance from Archangel because solar power is just so broken in after Kerbin because, of course, the sun is exploding a little bit. Um, so there's really no point, and also it would take so much longer. It's much easier and much faster, honestly, just to build more of them and just in orbit around Nemesis. If I needed more power, it would take less time and I'd probably get more power out if I just built like five more instead of trying to send each one down into a lower orbit around Archangel. And I really did need to sort of churn these things out. Ideally, we'd have had about a hundred of them. Uh, that would have maxed out the amount of power that our uh, plasma thruster could actually use, which is about 1250 megawatts. Uh, but as it stands, we've got each one producing about 300 megawatts of thermal power, which is then converted I believe into about 150, 160 um, megawatts of actual electrical power and then after it's all been beamed so it's got to be then <laughs> beamed through a, an x-ray laser and received and that's not particularly efficient so at the end of it the spacecraft the endurance actually gets 10 megawatts from each of these so <laughs> from 300 megawatts to 10 megawatts and it's not really hard to see why Elon Musk is not a big proponent of uh, space-based solar power, beaming it back. There are just so many uh, steps at which you lose such a large percentage of your energy. It's really not that feasible unless launch costs come down very significantly, which you know they may well do in the future if SpaceX's Starship is successful. But here we are. We have Bifrost 10, our final array. Uh, this was the point where I just ran out of patience, so I thought, you know what? We'll just we'll do it with just about 120 megawatts or so. They do each produce a little bit more. Um, well, some of them produce more than others because we've been upgrading our laser technology and our receiver technology uh, and efficiency as we've been building the array because we've been receiving science transmitted from Morningstar out uh, in the gulfs of deep space. 
But anyway, now, before we launch the Endurance, we have a little bit of housekeeping to do. A little bit of clearing up in low solitude orbit, because of course we've got these old interplanetary spacecraft, Reclaimer and Odyssey, and this old rickety space station, Thea, just sort of lying around, uh, using up space, and also they have a bunch of parts on them from mods that I'm not going to take into my next install. Don't worry, as I've been saying for <laughs> quite a few episodes, uh, this is not the end of our escapades in this save file, it is just the end of this series. Uh, there will be a new follow-up series but we're going to be upgrading this is in version 1.3.1 so this is before making history uh, we've had two expansions to ksp since then and of course we've got ksp2 fast approaching which is uh pretty exciting I mean, that's happened between the last episode and this one uh, but we'll leave all my speculation the like uh, about that and any questions you guys might have about my thoughts on it for some kind of q a video um, which i'll probably do another one of those in the next month or so but yeah there's a bunch of uh, parts on here as you can see the parts from uh, extra planetary launch pads that we don't really need we need the plug-in for extra planetary launch pads um, but all of the parts that we need are supplied by USI and those are the ones that we've been using on Artemis and they look a lot better than the base extra planetary launch pad you know workshops and orbital construction docks so I wanted the orbit fear basically so I can uninstall those parts and get my load times down a little bit more I'm gonna try and <laughs> decrease the amount of parts uh, I actually have in the install and the amount of mods. Uh, I'll probably chuck out a few that I don't need anymore because we're not really doing contracts anymore so we can probably chuck out contract configurator and a bunch of different things and try and slim down the install uh, a little bit when we go into 1.7 or 1.8 if it's come out by then but I believe that's just giving the planets, the stock planets, a facelift so uh, we're not too worried about that because of course we have a planet pack. So what we're going to do here is we're going to rendezvous Odyssey with Thea and Reclaimer. See we've sort of rearranged the space station so it's all going to be symmetrical. Then we're going to transfer all of the remaining fuel on all of these different old decrepit spacecraft into the fuel module on Odyssey because there's plenty of perfectly good fuel here and there's almost enough space in that fuel module to store all of it. So we're going to store all of our spare fuel in there and leave that bit in orbit and then the rest of it we're going to chuck into the atmosphere and let it die a glorious death a fiery viking funeral if you will now it's a shame to see these spacecraft go i mean they served us very well they took us out to the wasteland they took us out to demise although reclaimer did need a resupply mission because i didn't put enough fuel on it there are some good memories attached to these uh, and it is it is a sad moment an end of an era to have to deal with them like this but such is the fate of such large spacecraft when they Pass their best by date. I mean, that's going to happen to the International Space Station in the next decade or so. It gets to a point where it's just so much effort to keep maintaining it, it doesn't become safe anymore. And there's actually a sandblasting effect that being in low Earth orbit actually has on real life spacecraft. Because even though it's in a near vacuum, you've still got trace gases, you know, trace parts of the atmosphere. Um, sort of whipping against the spacecraft at, you know, orbital velocity, which very slowly does degrade the outer hull, uh, unless it's in a much higher orbit, like geostationary orbit and the like. So uh, instead of leaving it there to then come crashing down on a city in <laughs> 50 years or so, they're going to have to do a controlled deorbit and dump it into the Pacific Ocean. So that's what I'm attempting to do here, although my targeting wasn't particularly good because I've never really deorbited something of this size before or tried to do it with any kind of accuracy so I was aiming for the ocean but uh, we do end up slamming into the land thankfully this entire planet seems to be uninhabited apart from the launch site uh, so is the way with Kerbal Space Program. We're using the little nuclear tug that we've been using to sort of rescue um, Kerbals from low solitude orbit and uh, capture different parts of um, debris that we've been hired to bring back down to the surface and then sort of deposit those crew members on fear until we got another spacecraft that's free to uh, to take them back down to the surface. But what we're going to do is just use this to burn up some of the remaining fuel in fear and get it on a suborbital trajectory and then we're going to boost that back up into orbit on its own fuel because this is a pretty useful little tug and I don't really see any reason to deorbit that. It's just the main parts of the station. I did consider reusing chunks of Odyssey and Reclaimer like that nuclear block maybe using it as some kind of tug within the solitude system but it requires such little delta v to go between guardian nemesis and solitude because they're both in you know quite low orbits 
and they're such large clunky vehicles with outdated nuclear engines but we have much more powerful more efficient nuclear engines now courtesy of ksp interstellar there's really no reason to leave them around so they're just large pieces of junk begging to whack into something in a decade's time so the safest thing to do is let it go out with a bang and i'm just going to shut up and let you enjoy the fireworks Now the command modules of Reclaimer and Odyssey actually survived re-entry and the whole spacecraft actually did much better than I expected. But because of that we actually have two command modules that have each been to the wasteland and to Demise now landed on the surface which means we get a huge number of world firsts and actually complete contracts that I was planning to complete later on to return spacecraft from the wasteland and Demise. So that's it's actually pretty amusing. I wasn't expecting to be able to return these at all or complete those contracts for quite some time yet. And we also have two wonderful museum pieces for the wonderful children of solitude to admire. So now, out with the old and in with the new. This is the culmination of this entire series. We are launching the Endurance. This is a space probe that is going to head into interstellar space to another star and send back images of strange alien new worlds and potentially a habitable new home for Kerbal Kind. We're launching it on the uh, Albatross 15C, a little bit of nostalgia, probably in the next series we'll create uh, some more efficient launch vehicles, uh, but I thought yeah for old time's sake and just because it has around about the right amount of Delta V, we'll use this one and uh, we'll save the designing crazy new launch vehicles for the next series. And the I mean, even the existing spacecraft are going to look uh, a little bit different in the next series because, of course, you've got all the new textures from the KSP update, and I might also be using restock, which, of course, revamps the look of all the stock parts. Um, but let me know in the comments if you think I should use restock. It's quite a highly uh, recommended mod, so uh, I think I'll, I'll look into using that. So, we've deployed our second stage, there we are, and we're just about to deploy the fairing so we can actually get a look at this monument monumental spacecraft and yeah it looks it looks like some kind of weird insect uh, <laughs> it's not particularly impressive but it's in, it's designed to be entirely functional that massive sort of wing like structure is actually the antenna we need of course a huge radio antenna to be able to communicate over such long distances i did consider actually using one of the uh, beamed power lasers because you can use them for communication uh, so one of the x-ray lasers or something uh, to communicate over such long distances but they're really big and really heavy and this huge uh, communications array actually had a similar range well at least just enough range for our uh, needs so i thought i'd use that because it folded up it was much smaller and much much lighter which of course is far more important see so here just landing the first and the second stages and now we can plot our maneuver out 
to Valentine. I did actually install MechJeb for this specific purpose, but MechJeb has a limit on its computing power, and the fastest maneuver it could plot to Valentine would arrive us there in around about 100,000 years. Now that's a little over our time scale. We're trying to get Kerbals to, uh, to another star within a Kerbal lifetime preferably, so a probe arriving there and scouting out the star in a hundred thousand years, not particularly useful. But I just sort of used that maneuver to start us off, to get the inclination correct and everything, and from then on we're just going to continue accelerating towards Valentine faster and faster. Now I know that this spacecraft has about 300 kilometers per second of delta V, and you see here we've started up the plasma thruster and it produces basically no thrust whatsoever despite the fact we're receiving about 100 megawatts of power which is why i installed better time warp so we can knock the physics warp up to a hundred times and then i left it for five hours and just checked in on it now and then so we're going to accelerate up to about 300,000 meters per second and i know that that should take around about 10 years to get there so what i did is actually check the orbit of valentine it turns out in 10 years it's basically going to be at the same point in the sky that it is currently so all we really need to do is change our inclination point towards valentine go at maximum thrust and then just leave the spacecraft for a long time. You see here our inclination is getting better and I just sort of left it for a long time. As we started to near the end of our burn, you see the fuel's getting quite low and this far out from solitude the beamed power has uh, decreased in intensity quite a lot to about 5 megawatts so it's taking longer and longer the further away we get but as soon as we near the end of the burn I drop the physics warp down a little bit lower so we can see the moment when we run out of fuel and there it is 300,000 meters per second of delta V expended with our plasma thruster using liquid nitrogen which gave us the sort of best efficiency and thrust to weight ratio balance that uh, of all of the different elements we could have used. Now I had to do a bit of a Doctor Strange and go forward in time to actually find out when we arrive at Valentine because patched conics stop working a certain distance from a celestial body so I can't actually see when we're arriving but I just went forward in time and then reverted a quick save and we arrive at Valentine in just over 11 years or so. So we'll be arriving in the next series but in the meantime we'll have a number of different missions to do. Morningstar is going to arrive at Reaper. We've got Memento coming back from Drizzen. We've got a whole new series ready and waiting in version 1.7 or possibly version 1.8. And now I hope you can enjoy a nice little look back at all the different spacecraft we've sent all across the solar system. Just for reference, a Kerbal day is six hours long and a Kerbal year is 426 Kerbal days long. So that's just in case any of you get confused about some of the dates. Thank you so much everyone who has watched this series from the beginning. I hope you're looking forward to the next series as much as I am and exploring a strange new world. Thank you for watching everyone. I've been the Beardy Penguin and I will see you all next time. Thank you.